Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back with Community Matters, but it's also kind of bigotry in America we're talking about today. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. That's Peter H. Hoffenberg. He's a professor of history at UH Manoa. Been there for 25 years. 25 years. Um, and he's also uh, some adjunct or associate professor in, in uh, Israel, Haifa. in Haifa, Haifa, which is one of my favorite cities. It's the San Francisco of mm -hmm. Israel, isn't it? Um, where he teaches there, I guess, on occasion, maybe by remote. And you published something, too. What do you publish? Well, I do mostly work on um, exhibitions, world's fairs, uh, Indian art. I'm working on history of science now. So uh, absolutely nothing we're going to be talking about, but <laughs> that's probably a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I like to schmooze with Peter because, uh, you know, we live in a time of bigotry. And uh, I like to talk to him about that. I like talking about the, the Jewish situation and, and all the writings that are coming around and, and uh, the reaction of the Jewish people to various uh, unpleasantnesses that are happening. And so uh, today uh, we have a couple of things to discuss. I'd like to first discuss a PBS special. Um, it was last week about Vilna. And uh, Vilna was, uh, I didn't know this myself, Vilna's in, in uh, Latvia, uh, Lithuania. 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 Uh, and Vilna was um, a, a center of Jewish learning and, and religion um, in, up to the war. And then uh, as we got closer you know, to the war, the Lithuanians started um, beating them up and uh, tearing their temple down, which was the big temple. It was the biggest temple in the area, as I understood. Um, and it was a center. Uh, it was a really important place. And, and, and for that matter, Vilna was an important Jewish center in those days of learning, of culture, of practice, and so forth. And in this uh, documentary, there were there were movies, there were film clips of the people in, um, you know, in that temple, in that community. Uh, it was uh, small streets, you know, out of mm -hmm. old Europe, you know, um, and they were very religious, and they were our forefathers. And um, it was very sad what happened because the place, the temple, and the, that community it was pretty much obliterated by the um, uh, Lithuanians at first and, and then the Germans. Um, so it was a very hard movie to watch, but it was, you, couldn't, you couldn't put it down. And what's interesting is it, it, it took you for a ride from that whole issue, and the, the decimation is the wrong word because it was obliteration that happened rather than decimation, uh, was the way um, that the Lithuanians and the Germans dealt with the bodies of the people they shot in the trenches. This was before the gas ovens and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> this was this was really uh, sort of primitive. But they dug a big pit, and they stood at the side, put the people in the pit, a big pit with steep walls. Put the put the people, the Jews, inside and shot them, and left them there. You know that was it. They didn't care if they were dead or not. Just left them there. But they had caretakers, and when they had this assembly, this kind of conveyor belt. That uh, as as the Russians got closer, um, the uh, the people who were doing this killing were concerned, and so they made a, this very the Germans, I guess, they made this very ornate conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt would would pick the people up and drop them into a a pyre where they would burn every night. Uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of people would be burning every night uh, on this pyre, this wooden arrangement. And the the, the Jews uh, who were in charge, what did they call them in the camps? Uh, the one, kapos. the kapos, K A P O S. Okay, okay, we're we're living down there, living in the pit with all these dead people, and their job was to was to put the bodies on the conveyor belt. Okay, um, and and they knew uh, that uh, after a time. Uh, they would be the next. Well. They, they right. would because they were witness to all of this, and the idea was to was to obliterate the witnesses too. And so they dug a tunnel, right. and they dug, dug a tunnel from this hovel place that where they lived under the conveyor belt in the, the middle of this big pit, um, a couple of hundred feet away from from the the the, uh, the pit, and escaped. Eleven of them, only eleven of them, escaped. Um, and not, not many of them are alive today. I think some of them were shot after they escaped. And um, it's the story of, um, of geology, of geologists who came to Vilna now in, in modern times with high-tech electronic gear to try to find where the tunnel was in order to, I guess, validate the stories 
because the, the, whoever did survive talked about it, but um, there was no real physical evidence because uh, the Lithuanians built an elementary school mm -hmm. on top of this place, and it's hard to go down under. And uh, Anyway, I mean, what I got out of the, this movie, this documentary, was uh, uh, there are people who need to go back because their relatives were there or otherwise, um, and, um, and, and find where that tunnel was and find what, what the, you know, the, 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 uh, the monu monuments were of this particular place. What, what, what it raised to me, Peter, though, is why in the world with the Lithuanians, and for that matter, um, you know, the, um, I don't know if the Latvians were involved in this, but uh, also uh, the Ukrainians were involved in such hideous Bobby R kind of um, mm -hmm. murders. And it was, it was, it was not like the, the Germans later efforts with with the uh, you know the gas it was mono e mono it was personal it was you know f a physical killing rather than a gas killing and 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 they came to watch that that's the evidence they came to watch the Jews being you know uh, slaughtered in a, in a pit thrown in a pit they're, they're mangled bodies what what makes that kind of semitism happen which anti-semitism happen um, and it happened mostly in that area it, mo it was, and it was before the Germans got there. When the Germans got there, it got worse. Um, but do, do you have any thoughts about why that happened, why it happened there, why it happened in such brutal fashion, why it happened where, you know, you, you lived in a town. Mm -hmm. the, the Jewish guy was your neighbor, and now you were slaughtering him in the cruelest way, and his family, and his, they were bayoneting children at Vilna, bayoneting children. Um, why, why could that happen? Well, it's a particularly uh, poignant, tragic example, which has a lot of characteristics, though, which are resonant elsewhere. So let me try to take each of your really important points, and then we'll put it together at the end. So as Tim Snyder and others have reminded us, um, much of the killing was done in a non-industrial way. We have focused on Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and other places for um, generally good historical reasons. But in doing so, we've privileged that and forgotten about what occurred before. And then, of course, even what occurred afterwards with long death marches, when uh, Jews and others were removed from the camps as the Soviets or Americans were coming forward. So one important reminder and it's also historically an important reminder, is you don't need an industrial system. After all, in Rwanda, they used machetes. Uh, Pol Pot's executioner took a hammer and hit every single prisoner behind the skull to kill them. So you don't need uh, industry, okay? Secondly, that area, uh, again, revealed a kind of uh, rich, painful tragedy, which I think German Jews uh, can very well understand. Uh, there was a thriving Jewish community, but there never were the institutional protections for that community, never the integration of that community. I, I think that, uh, and I'm a uh, Litvak, so that is my heritage, and uh, Jews in that area would never think of themselves as Lithuanian. They would call themselves Litvak. Uh, same with Latvian or Estonian or Ukrainian, whereas German Jews usually use the adjective German Jews uh, because of the mythology of perhaps being integrated. So one is um, the evil that can be done by hand and personally, uh, including people you know. Uh, there were pogroms and thefts after 1945 in Poland where some people came home and were killed. After. Oh, you know, can I digress sure. on that point? You that know, is what's called neighbors about that, right. Yeah, there was there. There is right now in the Holocaust Museum. It shattered me to find this, um, an alcove uh, addressing that. Um, uh, you know, a lot of Jews left Poland, left that whole area, and they went to displaced pers uh, persons DP camps, DP right. camps in the in the soft underbelly of Europe. And when the war was over, 1946 or so, they tried to make their way back. They made their way back and. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think they were interested in any, any problem, any controversy, but th that was their home. That was their home in Poland. Well, the, the Poles who were there had occupied their stores, their homes, their farms, their gardens. I mean, there was, everything was taken. And so the, the Poles thought that the, uh, the Jews who were returning were, were going to try to recover their property, recover their farms and gardens and what have. And so they killed them. 
Right, and that difficult. happened very much in Poland. Um, I don't know if your audience uh, enjoys films or not, but there are two movies which deal very strongly with that. There's a black and white uh, Polish film called Ida, which came out two or three, well, maybe three or four years ago, I apologize. And then just this year, there's an award-winning film called 1945 about Hungarian Jews who return to um, their village. So the, the point I think, and you, you, you address it very well, is that personal animosity, for a variety of reasons, guilt, shame, theft, et cetera, continued afterwards. So we have the non-industrial, we have the, the sense of uh, personal uh, your willingness to kill a neighbor, because um, perhaps they're never really neighbors, or as Robert right. Frost said, you, know, right. you build fences for two reasons, <laughs> and uh, perhaps this was a fence of isolation. Uh, no institutional protections. I think um, scholars of the, of the region, and that's the region we fondly call east of the Alp, <laughs> so being a German Jew, I'm on, I'm on this side. I think most scholars uh, east of the Alp uh, would also recognize, uh, again, citing Tim Snyder, uh, that this is a vast bloodland where explicit political borders really meant very little. Uh, what meant the most was, as the Israelis and Palestinians would say, were the facts on the ground. So to call it Lithuania was almost meaningless. It was uh, part of Austro-Hungarian Empire or part of uh, expansionary Germany or part of the Soviet Union. The borders kept moving. And, so in, and part of that, though, was to generate um, an extremely virulent nationalism. And that extremely virulent nationalism uh, thought of Jews, not, not only Jews, but Jews uh, as never being Lithuanian, never being uh, accepted. Never being part of the nationalism. Ne never being part of the nation, in part you could argue because they're really, uh, if nations have to go through certain stages or certain convulsions, like certainly we, we did with the American Civil War, we probably should not be too high and mighty ourselves, if they have to go through certain convulsions, um, many of them have gone through convulsions over generations, whereas this region was just suppressed. The convulsions were within one or two generations. So you might have had a recognized country at the end of the First World War, which probably had been part of an empire before the war. And then by the 30s, you're either part of the Soviet Union or part of Nazi Germany. And during the war, you may very well shift back and forth. Uh, so some may think of themselves as patriots in those regions because they fought for the Nazis against the Soviets. Ah. So I think like, like most peasants in world history, uh, the Jews were caught up in the wrong place, very much the wrong place. The painful aspect, though, uh, of it, like the PBS or Nova show mentioned, is this was the Jerusalem of the North. This was a center of learning, yes. a center of flourishing. But look, anti-Semites um, hate Jews who have low IQs, anti-Semites hate Jews who have high IQs, anti-Semites hate Jews who can paint, they hate Jews who can't paint. So uh, just because it flourished meant a great deal to Jewish history and Jewish tradition, uh, but not necessarily to that region. There are other times and other places where flourishing Jewish culture has meant something to the regime. Um, for example, Maimonides. Right in, in Islamic Spain, yeah. right? Yeah. It's not a Jewish state; it's an Islamic state. Yeah. Maimonides, as uh, a font of uh, Arabic, uh, Hebrew, even Christian learning, was appreciated. It doesn't mean all Jews were appreciated, but oh, he was appreciated. Ultimately, it led to the Inquisition. Right. Um, so in that case, you can't really predict uh, whether or not Sanhagen is going to be anti-Semitic, whether or not it's flourishing or not. In this case, uh, it's another important reminder that the Shoah. Uh, destroyed um, not only individuals and not only families, but really destroyed a civilization. Yes. Uh, Eastern European, uh, east of the Elbe, Jewish civilization, uh, really for th you know five, six hundred years, had provided literature and learning. Uh, the Hasidic movement, which believes in the joy, joyful nature of life and the joyful nature, nature of God's relationship to man, that all grows out of the forests of that region. Um, and that, though, you know, was one of the goals of Hitler. It's also one of the goals of Stalin, uh, which is not just destroy individuals or families or institutions, but destroy entire civilizations. Even though those civilizations were not at war with you, those civilizations had no intention of hurting anyone. 
No, but um, you're absolutely right. But again, caught up in a war, uh, they were considered to be like, for example, uh, the tragedy of the Armenians in the First World War, who happened to be very close to the Russian front, were assumed to be fifth column. What usually happens, as we know historically, is um, those crises uh, don't create the idea that you are a fifth column. The fifth column is already around in people's minds. They already think of these people as, as not being nationalists. And a crisis like war gives them primarily an opportunity to do legitimately, and I'm using that completely tongue-in-cheek, yeah. uh, legitimately what uh, perhaps uh, they were restricted from doing beforehand. Uh, Raphael Lemkin, the Polish-Jewish uh, attorney who, who coined the phrase genocide, uh, genus, people, chide, murder, argued two things are necessary. And we've, we've studied genocide now since 1942 when he coined that. And, and I think people like Bauer and stuff have, um, they have more nuanced views. But in the end, um, in the end, his two pillars, Lemkin's two pillars, still exist. A group is isolated, denigrated, institutionally, socially, found to be lesser for one reason or another, found to be a threat. So maybe they're in a ghetto. Uh, maybe they're removed from positions of employment. Secondly, though, a major crisis, like a war, allows then the state and neighbors to do to those people who, what they might have thought of doing before, but didn't take that final step. And yeah. it's one of the reasons people today uh, very uh, strong-minded people say that, uh, you know, words matter, because <laughs> by using words, you're alienating or lessening somebody. Um, by keeping people from employment for one reason or another, uh, I'm sorry to be very contemporary, but by deciding two people can't just sit at a Starbucks, these are all sort of the, the preconditions, uh, which are not just about people not being equal, they're actually about intolerance. Yeah. And, and pe some people being, I mean, you, you can be different in a society, but equally different. Maybe that's, a, perhaps that's a possibility. And then that difference society. can be accentuated. Right. And but, before I mean, you know it, you have right. bigotry but, or worse. But it seems like in, in democracies and other kinds of regimes, um, to be different implies some kind of hierarchy. Yeah. I mean, the goal is, right, to be different without a hierarchy. Right to say to appreciate difference, right? Appreciate cosmopolitanism. That's, that'd be okay, but no hierarchy. Yeah. But inevitably, it seems whatever, and I leave it to the sociologists and the evolutionary biologists. Uh, it seems like tribalism, in one way or another, it does differentiates. It? And so Lemkin would say that you you need to be wary when a group can't have a certain position in society because they are that group, or a certain. Per person is depicted not as an individual, but just as a member of that group, as if whatever is wrong with that group must ipso facto be wrong. Profiling. Yeah, and that's where uh, certainly the conversation you started with comes in, that uh, although the Jewish culture was flourishing in Vilnius, it was uh, not thought to be a superior culture as local Christian culture, either Eastern or Western Orthodox. It was different and less. Yeah. This takes us directly to the book that you mentioned that you sent me an article about, um, about uh, what is it, Sem Sem Semitism. Semitism in three, in three open, parentheses. open parentheses. Right. When we come back from this break, okay, um, Peter Hoffenberg is going to tell you about Semitism the three open parens, and, and the fellow who wrote it, and what it means, and some of the profound things that it says. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation, we have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stanley Energy Man 
and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Weissman. Jonathan Weissman. 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 Jonathan Weissman is the operative term. And uh, the book is called Semitism with three parins on either side. And uh, I just I had my eyes dilated. So, I, uh, <clears throat> so being Jewish in America in the age of Trump. So that takes us to modern time. And I would read, and you told me you just finished reading this book. Right. You sent me an article about it. Uh, and I think it's really an important book uh, for Jews and for people who want to understand this kind of so, social mm, social friction, if you will, um, uh, to have this conversation. So tell us about the book, Peter. So let me start with um, the fact that we all know who write books that uh, Editors and publishers sometimes change the title to get people's attention. So I, I think that actually the uh, most important part of this book is not who is the chief executive right now. Uh, the, the argument uh, has several parts to it, some of which appeal to American Jews and some of which appeal to everybody who thinks of themselves as an engaged citizen. Let me begin with uh, the title, because the title is important. It's called Semitism Inside of Three Open Parentheses. And his first major argument is connected to this, that there is, beyond what most of us realize, a vast network of hate online. Vast. It's not just anti-Semitic and it's not just racist. It's violently misogynistic. So it's essentially the same as stalking, with threatening to do violence to women. And the three paragraphs, uh, so open parentheses, are ways for people online to identify Jews by their name. So Jonathan Weissman, nobody knows uh, if he's Jewish or not. Nobody knows if he goes to shul or not. Now he happens to be, but that's almost irrelevant because he was essentially outed as a Jew. And he's a longtime he's, editor at the yeah, New York Times. He's, been a, he's at the New York Times, he's been at various other newspapers, and he noticed that a whole bunch of folks he knew, um, most of them are Jewish, but it's a matter of picking a name, uh, were identified to try to avoid you know, the hate speech legislation. So rather than saying uh, dirty Jew online, you put a name and three open parens. And that's how the book starts. And, and let me give a, just a brief summary, because I know that uh, the viewers probably don't want a whole book report. But the, the brief summary is a couple of very important pieces. Uh, and again, for a moment, just remove the subtitle. One is that this vast network of online hate has brought together groups that otherwise would not know about each other. And they found in this hate a common denominator. Different generations, different regions, people who may hate different ethnic groups and know not nothing about the other ethnic group. So this is, if your viewers are economists or engineers, this is network theory. Mm -hmm. And network theory has linked people easily and repeatedly uh, and enduringly, because it's online. Facilita facilitated, so, for so sure, one of it, the internet, Certainly. Yeah. Now, one of the major questions a historian would ask is, um, you know, how much of this existed before? And we're putting piece, pieces together, and putting the pieces together makes it potent. Or the other possibility that putting pieces together has not only made it potent, it's attracted a lot of people. And that's, historians ask that question that's about scary. technology and stuff. So he begins with that proposition. Um, and the proposition that we saw last week with Zuckerberg, um, there's really very little that online companies can do or will do. Uh, 
there's a very uh, famous uh, uh, woman a game designer who was viciously attacked and had to get a temporary restraining order, and she has started a 501c3 for people who would like to be able to themselves make an effort to control. So that's how it begins. It begins with this notion that this is vast network of hate. Uh, sometimes there are people who will sit in their rooms eating potato chips and doing nothing. Other times, though, like in a small Montana town, they will motivate people to take action. So that's a, right. So that's as a lawyer, you can appreciate that constitutional. I mean, when does it become yelling fire in the theater, and when is it just sitting and muttering in the theater? Yeah, and, and the question and that's is, a is this harmless? So he raises that. I noticed that in the article he sent me. Right. Is so, this harmless or maybe not? Uh, there's nothing harmless. Hate is hate. But he skirts what's become you know, a really interesting question. Uh, is there a difference between speech and action? Right? For a while, a lot of legal theory has said, kept going back to Catherine McKinnon, that speech is action, and you need to address speech the way you address action. Um, and I don't think he takes a stand particularly on that. He does say, though, that we need to be wary because for some people, like Stormtrooper, one of the online connections, uh, what is speech is a call to action. Sure. So he mentions an event that everybody knows about, of course, Charlottesville, and how Charlottesville was in part possible because of this networking. Okay. So that, that I think, is of interest really to everybody. Okay. To American Jews, um, he has a couple of uh, particular points which I think are, are really rather interesting and they're not without controversy. Sure. Okay. So one is uh, going back to the old idea that uh, Jews are kind of the canary in the mine. And if there's hatred to Jews, there's going to be hatred to other people. Yes. Okay. And if that's the case, uh, and historically that's often the case, then um, like we saw yesterday when uh, Starbucks asked the ADL to organize the tolerance um, training, American Jews need to reach out and make connections and build bridges with other groups who also, right, who also are feeling hatred and, and hearing and, and hatred. And that's a proper role for the Jewish people. It is a proper people. role, but, been it's, a but proper it's not role. without controversy. So, well, for example, um, I don't do you want to get into the controversy? We only, we only have a minute or two left, okay. but uh, yes, All right. of course. So let me, I'll, let me do one controversy and then we'll get to a second point if we only have a minute or two left. Uh, some of those bridges might be built, uh, made with groups. Um, who are not necessarily tolerant of Jews, and certainly not tolerant of Israel. So that leads to a second, and I have 30 seconds, so for American Jews, the more controversial point. And his point is that the emphasis, the emphasis on Israel being the source of American Jewish identity has put Jews in a position where they may tolerate the intolerance of others because of their support of they want to support Israel. Israel. It's a very interesting, it's controversial, I'm happy to come back and talk about it, but it's a very po interesting point. Connected before we, to that, before, just connected to that though, is ironically his, his plea, and I think this is, this is significant, is what makes somebody a Jew. I want, you know, I want to uh, just close right. with a, sure. an, uh, I'll come an back. explanation. Yeah. There's always stuff we to talk about. We need you to come back. There's always stuff. There's, yeah. one, there's one explanation. I was looking for that particularly profound sure. point, and it springs off this quote um, about Israel and the connection with American Jewry and mm -hmm. Israel. Do you want me to read that? Uh, yeah. Can you okay. read it and explain it? So in the United States, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. If the United States becomes a country hostile to Jews, the alliance between the United States and Israel will not last. Wow. What does he mean by that? So if the U.S. becomes a place uh, a la um, Philip Roth's novel, <laughs> when Lindbergh becomes president of the United States, <laughs> right. um, we, America as a Western democracy and a liberal cosmopolitan democracy uh, must include Jews, and Jews must participate in that. And that participation is really better for an alliance with Israel 
And that trumps, really, whether or not somebody gets, sorry about the word, trumps, sorry. but I mean a little T, okay, uh, as a verb. Um, that trumps uh, the selling of a plane, okay? And uh, that trumps also the willingness of um, allying ourselves as Jews with certain people who are politically powerful now, but really don't have the interests of Jews in mind. And that is particularly the Messianic Christians yeah. who support Israel. Yeah. They don't support most of the other things that Jews support. So if you ask most Jews, most Jews support uh, you know, public secular education. Most Jews support abortion. Most Jews, uh, most Jews are support, liberal in the old-fashioned right, sense. Right, okay, very much so. These guys are not. <laughs> yeah, okay. and, and they're so, the ones behind Trump when he wants to move the capital to Jerusalem, right? Uh, they, they are, but they're behind a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, that's and and one of his arguments is if we make uh, if we make Israel the do or die issue and just outright material support, uh, we're actually potentially going to get end up in a, with a country which is hostile to Jews, <laughs> and that's not going to be very difficult uh, question. Yeah. It's a very important. I think underneath it all, and we'll, and I'm happy to come back and talk to you about it. Underneath it all is really the kind of classic diaspora question, which. What makes you a Jew? Yeah. Is it time. Israel? You know, is it Israel? Is it support civil rights? Is it reading Torah? Uh, there's, that's a great debate, what makes a Jew. Or all of these things and maybe right. different mixtures and measures. But the balance is difficult. The balance, yeah. yeah. So the name of the book um, Semitism. was Semitism. It's, he's a journalist. He writes very clearly. It's um, not a particularly difficult book to get through. I think for your audience, uh, if you're not interested in the Jewish side, just take a couple minutes to see how he charted this uh, real network of hate. And the network of hate ends up in a circular way connecting people who we you know, might thought of as being kind of kosher, and they're really not, not yeah, so kosher. Yeah, it's a very complicated it, yeah. business. Well, the connections are uh, anti-government. It's almost anybody who's anti-government, right? Yeah, yeah. Anti-cosmopolitan, so anti-globalist anti-universalist. <laughs> so it makes for some very strange uh, bedfellows. Jonathan Weissman, yeah. Semitism, uh, being Jewish, and we all ought to know how this works in America in the age of Trump. Right, so for your audience, oh, one, one second, just, just the Trump is in there because the argument is that uh, the election allowed these ideas uh, to flourish. They were there before. But there's no check on them. There's no governmental check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. much more to discuss. Definitely. Thank Pete, you very Peter much. Peter H. Halberg, professor.